he values money more than human life. And it's very interesting because all the, you know, the moment we start talking seriously about going after oligarchs, he's threatening nuclear war. Not that he's actually going to follow through on that today, but it shows you how much he values that, how upset he is by that. And that's our one bit of leverage. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Is war something that has anything to do with true crime? And is true crime relevant to war? Well, a few hours ago, it was announced that the some of the events in Ukraine are being treated as a criminal investigation, war crimes. And I think a case can be made that warmongers are the worst criminals and what they are doing is criminal. On the 24th of February, 2022, a large-scale invasion into the Ukraine started. We're coming to the end now of week one of the war for Ukraine. In true crime, we must ask, and we always do ask, the simplest question, why? Simple questions may be simple, but they are seldom easy. Two days after war kicked off, a YouTube channel put up a video, Why Russia is Invading Ukraine. It's very well made. It's been viewed about five million times but it misses the plot completely, in my opinion. To understand this war, you have to understand Putin, not geopolitics. To understand this war, you have to understand Putin's psychology and what has just happened in the last few kind of hours is that the focus has sort of turned to Putin's mindset, trying to understand what he's thinking. That is kind of the best strategy right now to figure out where this is going, what is actually happening. The same actually applied to Hitler. We think we can apply rational questions and answers, but sometimes, often, war isn't the rational chess game we think it is. Warmongers, like criminals, engage in war not because they are rational, but because they are not. I'm not saying everything about it is irrational, but a lot of it is. And to understand this irrationality is going to help you understand, predict, and evolve a better strategy. We saw this clearly with Hitler. Only a few see it right now with Putin. And the reason is not too many folks in the West know Putin very well. But Bill Browder does. You heard him at the beginning of this clip. Before we get started with the rest of this episode, if you don't know me, if you're new to this channel... I'm the author of over 100 books on true crime. I've also written books on mass shootings, on things as uh, diverse as the 96 Everest disaster. I've also covered the case of the Navy SEAL Chris Carl, who was at one time America's most sort of famous um, snipers. And then I've also written a fiction book dealing with a massive wide-scale war um, kind of a war to end all wars as well. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about the subject. I also think if you want to understand how war works and how the whole process works, it's really worth watching the World War II in Color series on Netflix that is out right now. Before we get to the rest of the episode, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. So go ahead and Google Bill Browder. He was on CNN's Amanpur a few hours ago, probably about a day or so ago. I'll put a link to that in the description. But in general, he was at one time the largest foreign portfolio investor in Russia. Browder has officially been deemed a threat to Russia's national security. And when you hear him speak, and he speaks really incisively, you can see why that is. We'll come back to Browder in a moment and deal with his astonishing and horrifying insights into the workings of Putin's mind. We'll also find our way to Putin's why via Browder's incisive analysis. But first I want to update you on the latest on the war for Ukraine. We start with stating the problem. Right now there's a 40 mile long Russian military convoy headed straight for Ukraine's capital. In some of the recent maps, it appears to be a giant W. And just as we saw in Lord of the Rings, this is an army calculated to break the unbreakable walls of Helm's Deep. And just think about the outcome here. Do you really want to allow um, Kiev to fall, to fall? Do you really want to allow that to happen? Do you want to come there afterwards to a ruined city? 
do you want to allow it to fall into Russia's hands and then you've got to reclaim it? Or do you want to prevent that from happening to begin with? So I've actually just heard on CNN a general, uh, I think it's an ex-command of NATO saying what they really should try to do is hammer that convoy before it reaches its destination. As far as I know, it's very close to its destination, something like 20 miles away, which, in other words, it's close to the staging area. And um, it does appear, and this this particular leader, um, ex-leader of NATO, I think, said that they should really take out every 10th vehicle, and that will stop this convoy kind of in its tracks. It will really slow down the entire thing. Um, I do think that the staging area that this convoy is headed to is the airport on the outskirts of Kiev. And Kiev's days, perhaps hours of freedom, are numbered. With a force like that, we're looking at a wrecked city, but it's not wrecked yet. And Kiev may be how Putin makes a symbol, an example of where Ukrainian resistance is going to get Ukrainians in the, for- in the face of overwhelming force. CNN has also reported in the last few hours of sightings of thermobaric bomb launches. These bombs do not destroy buildings or infrastructure. Instead, they suck the air out of a particular area, creating a, a kind of violent vacuum and shockwave, which causes fragile tissues of organisms to burst. I must also commend CNN on their coverage. They've had so many reporters on the ground providing intelligence in ways that I think are benefiting really the world community. There's talk now of a scorched earth policy, which essentially feels like the Russians gave Ukraine a chance to surrender. In fact, they actually had a uh, story that they were going to release to the public, uh, sort of congratulating themselves that uh, the war with Ukraine or the special military operation had been a success. They obviously totally underestimated what was going to happen. I think they thought Ukraine would be intimidated by this massive force gathering on their borders. And so if you think about it, the initial invasion, I think, was done with restraint and anticipating that it would just be sort of walking in and taking over. And um, they, this restraint was under the, again, under the assumption that they thought the Ukrainians wanted to avoid a full-blown war. And I think they do, but uh, you don't um, avoid a full-blown war by just giving your country over kind of thing. The fierce resistance the Russians encountered now, I think, in inverted commas, gives Russia the right, certainly the way they see it, in a sense to use deadlier force. And that's where we are now. That is where we are in terms of the momentum shift. It's now shifting to deadlier force, a sort of second wave of um, much more uh, violent and um, destructive attrition. Reporters and pundits have been saying the worst is yet to come, and we're starting to see that. There was recently a, a bomb that hit the, I think, a parliament building or a government building in Kharkiv, and there's actually video of that, and you actually see Um, vehicles driving around in front of it and then this building half of it basically is just wiped out and so it's plain to see that the worst is yet to come it's starting to happen now Putin isn't backing down and he isn't the kind of guy to back down that's also important to know he doesn't bluff instead of backing down expect him to double down that's exactly what's happening The other point to emphasize is that we're already seeing this expand from a war for Ukraine into a regional conflict with Belarus being roped in as a direct um, combatant allied with Russian forces. While on the other side, the EU is making the effort to make Ukraine part of the EU. In fact, I think they already are. Germany has broken decades of passive protocols to make weapons such as anti-tank missiles available to Ukraine. The same has happened with Sweden, uh, Finland, Norway, I think, as well, and even Switzerland is closing its banks to Russia, stepping across its own world-famous neutrality. Meanwhile, Putin has been talking about nukes and getting his nuclear deterrence in a state of readiness. So where do we go from here? 
and how can Putin be stopped? And the answer to that is addressing this question of why. And you may not think, again, you may not think that war has got anything to do with crime or crime has anything to do with war, but they are actually a perfect match. You also have a motive to go to war, right? You also have driving forces and dynamics to pay attention to. So first of all, I think the West have been spot on to react as quickly, as strictly, and with surprising solidarity as they have. This is a very, very urgent situation, and it's a dire situation that demands urgency and swift action, especially now, especially regarding this convoy you know, approaching um, Kiev, the outskirts. One has to be careful, however, in reacting to an escalation that you don't aggravate it even more. You don't want to escalate the conflict in Ukraine unnecessarily. You kind of want to contain it and try and control it, if that makes sense. That being said, it's less clear whether Putin doesn't want to escalate. His talk about nukes suggests he doesn't mind escalation, and this is already a clear insight into his motive. He could care less about casualties, including of his own troops. And I think that is actually a headline somewhere where they just said, what a waste of human life, and this is talking about Russians lying kind of on the roadside. I mean, he's marching them into a kill box, essentially. Imagine if you are a Russian soldier, and you're suddenly in a situation where your leader is ordering you into Ukraine. It's kind of, in a weird way, it's kind of Russia against Russia, in a way. Someone was talking about a opera house in Odessa that was formerly defended against the Nazis, and now the same opera house is being theoretically defended against the Russian invasion. So the, the, the opera house in Odessa was formerly defended by the Russians in the previous war. Now it's, they've got to try and defend it against the Russians, potentially. One American military expert described the opening gambit of Russia's invading force as amounting to uh, seven fronts attempting to take cities everywhere, but then failing to secure territory anywhere. And I think they have started gaining a little bit of territory in the south. The question now is, are they going to gain anything in the north where Kiev is? For a world-class army, this opening gambit seems particularly weak strategically, Remember, despite the size of the Russian military, the population of Ukraine, armed, means that for every three or four Russian soldiers, there are about a thousand civilians that are motivated, furious, armed to the teeth, ready to dig in and defend their homes. So, knowing Putin as a savvy strategist, a KGB strongman, a dictator in power now for 22 years, also a survivor, we've got to wonder, was the opening salvo intended to fail? I don't think that that is the case. I do think the idea was to was that he just thought it was going to be a cakewalk. So in that sense, he underestimated the resolve of the Ukrainians. It would have made sense from a number of perspectives to invade Kiev in the north first, probably easy to say in hindsight, but to put all your resources into that, get that done, and then concentrate on the rest of the country. And it does appear that that is the strategy right now. For one thing, the distance from Kiev to the Russian border along the M3 or Ukraine highway is relatively short, less than 500 kilometers. If you had to take another point of entry, you're dealing with a lot of circuitous and difficult routes inside. Second, if Putin does launch a nuke, so I don't think it's going to happen, but if it does happen, I don't think the West will respond in kind. I don't think you'll have... Uh, someone launching a nuke and then someone launching one uh, in response, that would actually be suicide. Instead, you, if that did happen, you would see the West bring out the, the sort of big guns, the, the non-nukes, but nevertheless serious ordnance. One could argue that the best way to counter Putin's invasion is to open up a flank on the far side of Russia with most of the forces committed to Ukraine, opening up a theater nine time zones further east let's say near Vladivostok, which is in a sort of area of Japan, Korea, um, the far east of the country, it's almost touching on Alaska, um, that would immediately stretch uh, one of the world's most powerful armies across the world's largest country. 
But that strategy assumes this is a rational war. It's not. I think a far savvier counter move is to keep the theater in Ukraine, send arms to the Ukrainians, but focus on disrupting those long, vulnerable supply lines. You don't really want to fight the Russians where the Russians want to fight. You want to, you want to fight this, uh, those supply lines. Um, you, want to, you want to destroy the supply lines coming into Ukraine from Russia. So in other words, you don't want to take them head on. You want to take them side on. And so, for example, if that 40-mile convoy can be smashed and crushed at the front and the back, you've got 30 miles of, 30, about 39 miles of vehicles that aren't going anywhere. And you've just taken out a massive chunk of the Russian military. You've just um, taken a lot of wind out of the invasion cells just in that one maneuver. And that then brings us to the third point and the point of this analysis. What is Putin's motive? I can't do any better than Bill Browder's own words on Putin uh, expressed on Amanpo a, few, a couple of hours ago. As I said, I'll put a link to that in the description. I really advise you to watch it. But take note, some of the takeouts from Browder's analysis are that Putin isn't engaged in this war for Russia, right? So you might have all these ideas about military strategy and think about Putin being a military strategist and that this is some kind of um, strategic invasion. You might think that it's an in he's engaged in this for gas or for oil. It's not really a war for anything in particular. If you take Browder's position, it's actually just a diversion. And you might think that is just farcical or even sounds like conspiracy theory. But if you know Putin and you know the context, the historical context of what's going on, it really makes a lot of sense. So any analysis really about why Russia is invading Ukraine from a sort of rational perspective of, well, you've got these strategic interests, etc., and these economic um, uh, incentives, that doesn't really take into account Putin or Putin's motive. Um, you know, it's completely missing the point. It's really tap dancing around the reality rather than dealing with the reality itself. So do you see it's not so much a geopolitical scramble as something personal going on with Putin? And guess what that is? Putin has amassed a fortune of around $200 billion, not million, billion. Where do you think that money is? And that's one side of the equation. In other words, this is about Putin protecting Putin. It's about money. It's about meat and potatoes, greed. And as you heard at the beginning of this clip, that is his Achilles heel. Hitler's war was, I think, to begin with, something to do with Hitler repairing Germany's battered esteem and also extending its living space. But ultimately, World War II was about Hitler going rogue and off his rocker. Even his own generals and commanders no longer respected him, but obeyed his craziness out of fear. Hitler eventually took the position that it was all or nothing, win all, but if you lose, well, then you deserve to lose completely and utterly. You deserve to lose everything, not only your life, but everyone ought to be destroyed. Well, in a situation like that, where a leader takes down hundreds of thousands of people, millions, in fact, as part of his own pathetic effort to find self-esteem. You know, you could say he's finding self-esteem for himself, but he's also finding self-esteem for himself on behalf of his countrymen. Um, and he's doing that on a global stage in a war footing during an extended combat theater scenario. You know, in a situation like that, is, isn't it really better to kill that person, to do away with a leader like that who is going to drag everyone into a war, not only his own countrymen, but obviously um, his opponents? He's going to create a world war. And do you really want to allow someone to do that? Right? It's really taking, having somebody, um, allow somebody to take lambs to the slaughter. So one does wonder where this will end, when this will end, how this will end. Will it be similar to how Hitler met his end? And bear in mind, at the same time Hitler died, the war also ended in terms of the war in Germany, right? So... Sometimes that is how these wars do end, is 
with the death of the leader. The other side is Putin has been watching the writing on the wall. This is such incredible insight from uh, Bill Browder, is that Putin has been watching the writing on the wall as despots in Belarus, that um, was happening as recently as December 2021, and Kazakhstan in January 2022, these despots have been deposed. And um, he has been watching this while relatively isolated during the coronavirus pandemic and probably feeling increasingly paranoid, increasingly vulnerable. And so how are you going to hold on to your 200 billion? Well, Putin has become convinced that someone is out to get rid of him. I'm not saying without good reason. Recently, we've had the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. Um, That's also contextually quite relevant. And so there have been kind of attempts on, on different people's lives and he's probably convinced that they're trying to get rid of him. So how can he defend himself? Well, attack is the best form of defense. Create a misdirection. And what better way to preoccupy everyone in terms of your population than with a war to get your critics off your chest, to get um, the, uh, the, the thoughts and minds of people not on you, but on this war that is taking place. And bear in mind, he didn't think it's going to last a very long time. You know, it's going to put him in a good light that he just walks into Ukraine um, and uh, raises the Russian flag there, well done. Uh, And he's the hero. Putin is the hero in that situation, except that hasn't happened. So his motive is Putin is doing this to stay in power, to enhance his power, that was the what he's trying to do. But staying in power means he stays in control. And that also means he retains access to his massive fortune. Losing power means he may lose everything and may face prison or death. Bill Browder refers to Putin's fortune as ill-gotten gains and that Putin only cares about money and himself. It does feel like that. It does feel like this invasion is about somebody who doesn't care about other people, even his own soldiers like an urban battle like we are talking about here is going to be very costly to the Russian military. Also, the way that the, this invasion was calculated, uh, it's like surround the whole country and simultaneously invade, invade from all sides. That is also going to be very damaging to your own military, even if you win. So Putin's Achilles heel is that his money is held in the West by Russian oligarchs, and that money is now behind a wall some of the oligarchs also turning against Putin. Score a point for the West, but the issue is Putin is backed into a corner now. And according to Browder, who knows Putin very, very well, Putin doesn't back down. You corner him, he doesn't back down. Putin will, res- will respond to resistance and defeats, not by backing down, but by doubling down. So what happens if things escalate and then you would expect Putin to back down. What's going to happen after the second wave? If he won't take the off-ramp, even if he's, or, if he's offered one, well, I think what you can expect is serious escalation. So you may have serious escalation in the second wave. If Putin still isn't uh, victorious, then aren't you going to have a third wave that's even more serious? And that appears to be where we are now. The first week in the war for Ukraine wasn't an invasion. It was the calm before the storm. Thank you for listening to this podcast. If you'd like to hear more on this subject, uh, leave your uh, thoughts and messages in the comments. And I'll see you guys next time.